What is an M&M? The answer seems simple at first, right? They're the colorful round chocolate candies that melt in your mouth, not in your hand. And they've been like that since way back in 1941. Yeah, even before World War II. But today we're not talking about those M&Ms. At least, not that version in particular. No, today we talk about everyone's favorite anthropomorphic candies. Today, we figure out the lore of M&M commercials. I forced myself to sit down and watch every single M&M's TV ad since the marketing campaign began in 1994. 27 years of talking candy commercials to figure out what exactly these things are. And well, what I found out paints a terrifying world these chocolates live in. The six anthropomorphic M&Ms we see are a combination of M&Ms and humans. Mind-blowing stuff, I know. Though, when you really think about it, it seems obvious, right? They have the body of an M&M, but with human appendages. How do we know that these appendages aren't just some weirdly shaped chocolate? Because the commercials straight up tell us so. This does not taste like chocolate. Says Yellow. You want to know why? Because it isn't chocolate. They're real human shoes, real human arms, and real human legs. This explains why the group doesn't eat the limbs when devouring one of their own as well. Okay, so maybe I lost some of you all with that statement. I mean, I don't blame you, it's a crazy assessment to make out of nowhere. But it all adds up. It explains why the M&Ms are all miraculously no English, or whatever language your commercial plays in. Deliciosa. ¿Por qué tengo la impresión que te gustó solo porque soy un chocolate M&M's? It explains why Yellow doesn't know he's even an M&M. Wait, we're the same as those? It explains why an M&M would take a shower despite there being no reason one should, unless it thought it was a human. And it explains why, for reasons only God knows, there are human M&M relationships scattered throughout these ads. We see red, yellow, green, and brown, all the M&Ms that see major speaking roles ready to get it on with humans. Now, not only is this weird on a societal level, I mean, come on, they're freaking M&Ms for crying out loud, but it's weird on a scientific level. Zoophilia is a sexual disease in which a human is attracted to a non-human species. According to multiple studies done, don't even ask me why there's multiple studies on this, that's kind of weird. But about 5% of men and 2% of women sexually fantasize about species other than human, which is a bit too high in my honest opinion. But these numbers are important. Why? Because it's safe to assume that the M&Ms have similar brain functions as humans, given their propensity for speech, their limbs, etc. So reason would tell us that only 5% of the M&Ms would be attracted to humans, right? So at most, maybe one of the group would have the hots for humans. But no, we see on multiple occasions that these M&Ms are single and ready to mingle with people. What do you mean? What does that mean? It means on a neurological level that these M&Ms don't see humans as a different species, but their own. Tinder? More like kinder, cause these people have it bad for chocolate. So, they're at least part human. Now let's prove that they're also M&Ms, which should be easy. In a commercial with actor Patrick Warburton, he questions the notion that M&Ms are eating the chocolate candies, saying, quote, You don't eat your own kind, it's unnatural. Not only do M&Ms not correct Mr. Warburton, but they even listen to him, switching bags to not eat their own specific brand. In fact, this theme of cannibalism is mentioned several times throughout the series of commercials. Check out my Halloween costume. What are you going as? A cannibal. Now, some of you may be wondering, how in the world does something as crazy and outlandish as a human candy hybrid come into existence? Well, the answer is simple. 
and it's been staring us in the face in all these commercials. Magic. Magic exists on this earth, and we see it all the time. Genies granting wishes, time travel, a real Santa Claus walking around, and most importantly, an M&M finding a lucky penny and turning himself into what else but a human. So what's the timeline here? Why are humans in all the commercials so casual and accepting talking candies roaming around the streets? Looking at these questions and what we know about the M&M CU, it's clear that someone at some point wished for M&Ms to become real. Heck, maybe with all his business connections, even Forrest Edward Mars himself, creator of M&Ms, wished for the candies to come alive to help sell his new product. It makes complete sense in the context of this world. The magic is there. So with a wish and a poof, let's say in 1941 or somewhere in the past, a genie makes M&Ms real, living hybrids of humans and M&Ms. However, as with all genies, this wish has a twist. From that moment on, let's say there's a small random chance that any M&M can turn into a living one. Not only that, but every red, yellow, or whatever color M&M will have the same personality, same memory each time they transform. A linked consciousness, one individual M&M, transcending 70 years. Every red acts smug and arrogant, every yellow acts dumb, every brown acts smart. They're the same person. How do we know that these are the same mentally M&Ms but different physically? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we see on multiple occasions that these candies get killed and eaten left and right by humans. It's like Attack on Titan. The M&Ms are the humans, and the humans are the Titans. Except that in this universe, the M&Ms can come back. Oh, okay, so maybe it is just like Attack on Titan. But the point still stands. These candies are getting eaten constantly. Not only that, but we don't see any weathering on the coating of them. If they were all the same candies from the start, wouldn't we see some cracking, discoloration, or fading at all? This brings me to my next point. How do we know these transformations are even happening randomly? Because we see plenty of times where mundane M&M purchases turn from the small little candies into the tortured six. In people's houses, at the grocery store, even on planes. These people aren't even surprised when this happens. They've accepted it because that's the way it's been with M&Ms for years. This shared consciousness and cycle of transformations also explains why the M&Ms aren't as terrified of death as they realistically should be. Moments like Red brushing off the prospect of multiple people trying to eat him. I've had three people try to eat me today. Three! Miss Brown essentially being an accomplice for murdering Red. Yeah, uh, thanks for introducing us. Anything for a friend. Anything for a friend. And the group even ganging up and devouring their hazelnut relative. The only way this group will be so chill with death is either they're all psychotic or they know it won't matter. Death is but an inconvenience to these M&Ms, a minor setback before they respawn somewhere else, wherever M&Ms are sold. Look at Yellow when he gets bitten, he turns into a ghost, and at the very end, we begin to see him floating away, presumably getting ready to possess yet another Yellow Peanut M&M. As long as Mars Inc. keep producing them, the M&Ms are eternal, immortal beings trapped in a purgatory of being born eaten and reborn and there it is all the facts right in front of us these creatures are human m m hybrids that have been existing on this planet for decades they came into existence randomly whenever an m m is made bought or opened every m m of the same color has the same brain is the same individual person when an m m dies they respawn somewhere else it explains why the M&M's have no issues eating the actual candies, they're just that, candy. It explains their nonchalant behavior towards death. It even explains something as obscure as the 2011 commercial starring the deserted island man wishing for M&M's. Looking back at it, it's actually a genius decision on his part. This man finds a lamp, and a genie appears. 
He wishes for a cool car, some hot cheerleaders, and finally, a red and yellow M&M, specifically the talking ones. Why? 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 Why would he do this? Because he knows that if he wishes for something smart like a boat, it'll sink. Or a cell phone, it'll have no battery. Genies love to mess with their wish grantees, so the man knows the only way to outsmart one is to play dumb. The car and the woman are for comfort and when he gets back to civilization. The genie, seeing these as useless wishes, grants them with no problem. Then, the man wishes for two M&Ms, his third and final wish. Again, the genie does understand the game being played and grants this no issue. Now, here's where the galaxy brain strategy comes into play. Having red and yellow in front of him, the man can explain where he thinks he is, what his name is, and any other amounts of info he can to the M&Ms that help them find him. Once red and yellow have all this down, the man can simply eat the two for sustenance and wait to be saved by the reincarnated M&Ms in his comfy car with his hot cheerleaders. It's the perfect plan. And that, my friends, is the not-so-secret truth of everyone's favorite spokes candies. The truth that Mars Inc. has been hiding from us for 27 years. Thank you all for watching. Let me know if I convinced you down in the comments, and give this video a thumbs up if you liked the analysis. This has been Brian, and I hope to see you all for the next video. Bye for now.